The Taimir Peninsula is the northernmost continental region of the world. Half the size of Europe, it is covered in snow for nine months of the year. During this long winter, temperatures often plummet as low as minus 50 degrees centigrade. In the middle of the 19th century, Alexander Middendorf, a German scientist from Estonia, led an expedition of the Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg that crossed the Taimir Peninsula from south to north. Pushing the limits of human capabilities, the expedition discovered unknown plant life, uncovered the culture of Siberian native peoples, and added new place names to the map of the Taimir. The Russian Tsar and the British Royal Geographical Society decorated Middendorf who became an established part of the history of Siberian exploration. 160 years later, a group of Estonian scientists was inspired to mount an expedition to follow in the footsteps of Middendorf, their famous compatriot. The goal of the expedition was to experience the harsh conditions of Taimir in the same way he had, and to research the changes that had occurred in both the land and the people. The Arctic is like an endless book which takes generations to read. On the Taimir Peninsula, you can encounter the world's largest herd of wild reindeer. You can see thousands of birds that have come to the rim of the world to nest. And you can fish on the rivers in the company of the indigenous people of the region. Although other explorations that followed Middendorf's had not yielded spectacular discoveries, this new generation of explorers remained enthusiastic. The skis that Middendorf had used on his Taimir expedition got a routine makeover at a conservation lab in Tallinn, and I was allowed to watch this process. As I touched those withered pieces of wood, ravaged by time, but still recognizable for what they were, I felt the same emotions as when I was a little boy reading about Fritjof Nansen's expeditions to the North Pole. I too wanted to experience the hardships and see the natural wonders encountered by my famous predecessor. It was a longing that soon became nearly unbearable in intensity. Alexander Theodor von Middendorf was born in St. Petersburg in 1815, son of a professor of the Pedagogical Institute. His father owned an estate in Estonia, where Alexander spent most of his childhood years, and it was in Estonia where he began his academic career. In 1832, he began his studies at the medical faculty of Tartu University, which then offered extensive courses in the natural sciences. He completed his degree at the age of 22, became a doctor, and spent two additional years studying zoology at universities around Europe. Middendorf's interest in the exploration of distant lands, and especially northern regions, was planted in his mind at a young age by his mentor, Professor Karl Ernst von Baer. He had, in fact, accompanied Professor Baer on expeditions to the Kola Peninsula and the Arctic Ocean. Baer was very influential at the Imperial Academy of Sciences and recommended that Middendorf lead the expedition that was being planned to the far northern regions of Siberia. As a young and unknown scientist, he would never have been granted the honor and responsibilities that went with such a position without his influential mentor's help. Middendorf was just 27 years old. The data he collected during the expeditions over the following three years would keep him busy for decades and culminated in his main work, a journey to the north and east of Siberia. This book was also a main source of information for our film. Middendorf's three-man crew left St. Petersburg by sled in November 1842, facing a 6,000-kilometer journey through the European part of Russia and western Siberia. 
the last 2,000 kilometers were on the frozen surface of the gigantic Yenisei River. The horses pulling the sleds were replaced first by dogs and eventually by reindeer. Middendorf was accompanied by his Estonian valet, Michael Furman, and Danish forester, Tur Brandt. Later, a Russian topographer, Vasily Vaganov, joined them to face the great frozen unknown. At the end of March, we reached Durino, and with it, the more heavily forested zone. This so-called village consisted of only four buildings. The great distance to the next habitation and also the preparations for the crossing of the infamous tundra forced me to stay in this place for several days. The Dudino of the past has become the modern-day town of Dudinka. The former tax-collecting outpost is now the capital of the Taimir Autonomic Region. Here, 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, where the coldest air temperature recorded was minus 57 degrees centigrade, lived two-thirds of the Taimir's 40,000 people. Ships and aircraft maintain their tenuous connection to civilization. The port of Dudinka is the biggest on the Yenisei, and it is kept navigable around the year by nuclear-powered icebreakers. Today's expeditions to the Taimir also begin in Dudinka, where all documents and permits required for visiting the peninsula are obtained. Facing each other on the main square of the town are a brand new Russian Orthodox church and a memorial to Lenin, a reminder of the great experiment of communism. The legacy of those times can also be seen in the multi-story prefabricated concrete apartment blocks that proved so poorly suited for the far north. The Taimir Peninsula is a special border district. All non-locals, including Russian citizens, need permits from the border guard as well as the state security organs and are advised to hire local guides. We were approached by a man named Leonid Kosterkin, or Loptumyaku, the son of a famous shaman from the native people known as the Naganasans. He simply announced that he would be our guide. There was not much to do in Dudinka. As soon as we got our permits, we hurried northward to the tundra of Avam, to the lands of the Nagana Sons and the Dolgans. Our funds were somewhat short to try to get to the Arctic Sea in one go. Here we were, after 160 years, ready to retrace the path of Middendorf's expedition. Our crew consisted of Janusz Pahl, a botanist, Ivar Yusi, a zoologist, Riho Vestrik, a historian, and Arvo Vilu, a cinematographer. Our team was determined to replicate the same scientific observations that Middendorf had accomplished alone. A paved 100-kilometer road leads from Dudinka to the industrial center of Norilsk, running parallel to the most northern railway line in the world. This is one of the only roads on the Taimir Peninsula. Norilsk greeted us with smoking chimneys and dead tundra. A metallurgical plant complex is the main reason for human presence here and is threatening to be the cause of an impending environmental catastrophe. Our destination was the port of Valyok on the banks of the Norilskaya River. Standing on the pier, watching carcasses of reindeer that had been hunted by the indigenous people of Avam, it occurred to us that we were standing at the gateway of the little low tundra described by Middendorf. In Soviet times, the previously free nomadic peoples of the tundra 
were forced to hunt and fish according to government prescribed compulsory quotas. Now control over hunting and fishing in the region is maintained in much the same way by a private company called Promos Tamirski. We were passengers on their company owned vessel. the Geolog was conveying a barge loaded with diesel fuel to the village of Ust Avam. The watercourse is the only avenue available during the summertime to supply fuel and building materials to villages hundreds of kilometers away in the tundra. Provisions for winter must be delivered during this span of five to six weeks, which starts with the high waters of the spring ice melt and ends with the low waters of autumn. Middendorf passed through here in wintertime, and several of his companions had already fallen ill in Dudinka. We departed on the 4th of April. We placed the patients into a fur-lined box. We deviated from the road we had taken until now and bid farewell to the old Yenisei, whose thin ice had carried us more than 200 miles and directed our sleds northeast over the northern part of the Pesino Lake to the village of Vedenskoye, near the estuary of the Pesino River. At first, we made our way over the low hills of the divide between the Yenisei and Pesino, but from Vedenskoye onwards, the forestless tundra appeared again. It is called the Little Low Tundra. All boats going northwards must negotiate Lake Pesino and it's a serious ordeal for a helmsman. The lake stretches for 70 kilometers and is 15 kilometers wide. It's shallow and in places has a mere 50 meters of fairway between shifting sandbars. During a storm, there's constant danger of running into a sandbar. We had the good fortune to make the journey in seven hours. When we entered the Pasinal River, the distance to the ocean was 800 kilometers. 1,200 kilometers north of our hometown of Tallinn in Estonia, we were now back on Middendorf's track. We were about to enter the Arctic tundra. The next morning after traveling for less than 24 hours, we changed course from Pasino to the Dudipta River, so the boat crew could have a much needed rest. our first chance to get acquainted with the nature of the little low tundra. The sandy banks of the river bore clear signs of the local wildlife. The footprints that we initially thought were made by a wolverine turned out, after Ivar measured them, to be those of a bear's. The main goal of Middendorf's expedition was to examine the lives of animals in harsh climatic conditions not so much to describe them or to take account, but to find out how they had adapted to the cold and the permafrost. The arrival of the Estonian botanist turned out to be a little on the wet side. Not many species of plants live in the tundra, so the probability of finding new ones was very small. <laughs> Then 
Middendorf also investigated plant life on this tundra. He found five unknown species of flora. Two of them now bear his name. In the early 19th century, botanists had considered average air temperature to be the only important factor in the distribution of plant species. Middendorf was keenly interested in other factors. The absence of the nightly rest period during the polar day, constant sunlight, varying amounts of precipitation, and permafrost. Our Nagana-san traveling companion, Loptumyaku, had not been to his birthplace for several years. It had been a long time since he had connected with his ancestors. After the fall of the Soviet regime, the natives of the region had the opportunity to rent land and start private enterprises. Most of them failed, partly due to widespread bureaucracy and partially because of the vodka that became abundantly available in the free market economy. Too much vodka and red tape had also affected the fate of our guide, Loktumyaku. Children who were born into the villages where their parents were forcibly settled have spent their whole lives in the new reality. The village of Ust-Avam gives us an insight into the consequences of turning nomadic people into townsmen. Many of these nomads have neither the knowledge nor the capabilities to handle the problems of sedentary living, of how to dispose of garbage or how to stock up on fuel. The natives, whose lives had been fully self-sustaining, have now become fully dependent on supplies from the central government, which have rendered them passive and eroded their ability to embark on enterprises of their own. The village of Ust Avam was established in the 1930s, cobbled together from two hostile tribes the Nagana sons of the Samoyed people and the Dolgans, descendants of the Yakuts Tungus and Russian settlers. In the melting pot of the Soviet Empire, old hostilities were quickly overcome, and now mixed families who use the Russian language are commonplace. The barracks that house the natives are heated with coal, which is brought in on river barges. Of the factors that make them dependent on the central government, coal is the most significant. If deliveries of coal were to stop, it would prove catastrophic, because local resources of wood for heating would not last for even one winter. Our guide, Loptum Yaku, took his job seriously. Included in his program for us was a viewing of the making of untas, the traditional winter footwear of the Tundra people. The traditional crafts of the natives have hardly changed, if at all, from the times of the nomadic lifestyle, when all clothing and footwear were handmade. 
In Soviet times, when the handicraft items of the northern natives were popular souvenirs, a production line for untas existed in a big workshop in Ust Avam. The soles of the untas are made from dried reindeer skin and the uppers of cured skin specifically from the legs of reindeer. In the past, stitching was done with sinew, but now a factory produced coarse thread is used. When visiting the Avams, I had my first opportunity to experience the Samoyeds in their natural circumstances. They are a lively and generally pleasant mannered people, especially the younger ones. I was later told that the Avam Samoyeds are held in esteem for being the richest and most skillful among the tribes of the Samoyed people, mainly because they are handy in the art of blacksmithing and they make their own spare heads. The women were generally treated well but seemed nevertheless quite submissive, as none of them dared to even ask for their share of vodka. They do, however, make constant use of the pipe and tobacco. The women's skirts are covered with braids and red-colored leather ribbons, which are suspended from their waists. Yet these most apt people are called savages. This is no doubt due to their resistance to Christianization and avoidance of the settlers. They are well aware of their own strength and abilities and their general free and independent mindset. As the day passed and our guide Loptumyaku got more and more drunk, he asked us to accompany him to his family's burial place, situated some distance away from the village in a desolated spot. Here is where the last two great shamans of the Nagana San people, Loptumyaku's father, Tubiaku, and his older brother, Demnime, rest. <laughs> Они смотрят на меня, ну, ну, не меня одного, а вас смотрят, и меня видят, как видят, потому что, как вам объяснить, как будто бы я, я обращаюсь не к этому, к этому всему вселенному, я разговариваю со своими родителями, ты гера, гера, ты, ты меня, the painful changes of modern times have drastically altered the rituals of one of the oldest Arctic nations. It seems that Ngana sons now use the spirits in vodka as a medium for communicating with the spirits of their ancestors. Graves have also been introduced as a recent custom, induced by a forced stationary lifestyle. In centuries before, the dead were simply left in the tundra together with some offerings.
The vast open space of the tundra is actually an enormous burial place where remainders of the Samoyed burials can be found strewn about even in the remotest areas. Here a man's sled, there a women's sled, here a small symbolic sled marking a burial of a child. As recently as the final decades of the 20th century, dead Nagana-san children were placed on the limbs of trees in their coffins. Now the sedentary lifestyle has destroyed most of the trees suitable for this purpose because the wood is needed for kindling to start coal fires. And the people, for some reason, do not have a concept of conserving natural resources. They end up cutting down trees even around sacred burial places where people really should not go at all without a reason. Middendorf was the first scientist to research the culture of the native people of the Taimir and also their shamanism. His work was followed a century later by the Russian anthropologist Yuri Simchenko, whose tools included a film camera. It was a time when shamanic rites were still performed by Loktumyaku's father, Tubyaku, and his older brother, Demnime. One of the main heroes of the film shot in 1978 was Demnime's grandson, Igor, or Neguchamaku, his Nagana-san name. In the shamanistic world view, the universe is divided into three. Below is the underworld, the realm of the dead, in the middle the realm of man, and above it all the realm of the gods or heaven. All three worlds are connected by the world tree which has its roots in the underworld and its top in heaven. A shaman is a mediator between the worlds of men and spirits. He uses ritualistic chanting to reach an ecstatic trance, a state of altered perception which helps his spirit travel to other worlds. The useful information that a shaman is able to gather during his stay in the spirit world is shared with the people after the ritual. It was like this at the time of Middendorf, as well as at the time of Demnime, 30 years ago. Nguchia Maku was only five years old when he first took part in his grandfather Demnime's rituals with his own drum and shaman's hat, but he has not become a shaman himself. His spirit was broken by Soviet propaganda, which systematically attacked the traditional customs of the Nagana-sans, especially shamanism. The young Naguchamaku was constantly mocked and teased in school, and at one point, when he was only eight years old, even contemplated fleeing into the tundra and never coming back. Today, attitudes toward shamanism have relaxed, but all the great shamans have passed away to the realm of the dead. Even the mother of Naguchamaku, a shamaness herself, who left her shaman's robes to her son, is long gone. It was time to get ready for the rest of the journey. We were situated at latitude 71 degrees north on the northernmost fringe of the forested zone, if you can call a few sparse Siberian larches a forest. 
we plan to trace our way back to the Pesino River. In partial emulation of Middendorf, who built his own boats on the spot, we made modifications to our rubber boats, furnishing them with better oar locks. We also plan to add masts and sails. The mood of our guide, Loptumyaku, was growing gloomier and gloomier as the day went on. It was obvious that he was trying to suppress his impulse to stay behind. All the changes to our boats were completed, and we were ready to go, but no one could find Loptumyaku. Middendorf had a very similar experience. He was abandoned by his Dolgen guide in the middle of the tundra without any explanations. Our patience began to wear thin. I went to the village to search for the deserter. <laughs> Lopsum Yaku made his choice and removed his gear. He would stay behind. We started out at about midnight, looking forward to a 180 kilometer boat ride. As we followed the river, we hoped to get better acquainted with the wildlife of the Avam Tundra and also to meet some natives other than those from this alcohol soaked village. In the morning, we attached the masts and raised the sails, which we had made from tarps. Everything worked just fine. By consensus, we appointed Ivar as our commodore and christened our small fleet the Flying Galoshes. The Avam River flows into the Dudipta, which is nicknamed Broadway because of its lively traffic. Here, you stand a good chance of meeting someone nearly every day. The scattered households of hunters and fishermen on the banks of the river are tens of kilometers apart from each other. We stopped for a rest in Karal, where two Dolgan families live, with four children each. <laughs> Nika, вторая. Игорь, третий, вот он, Игорь. Вот Иосиф. И там он. Вот Алена. Юля, вот она. Все, еще кого -то. Вас как зовут? Не, Ивар зовут. Ивар. Иди, Ивар. Так как? Рихо. Рихо. Иди, Рихо. Дом. Папа, а ну фри. А теперь сама встань здесь. Меня Варя зовут. Покажи я теперь. Ануфри и Анатоли make their living, like other Таймир тундра dwellers, by fishing and hunting. Their income depends as much on good fortune as on the middlemen who buy their fish and game and provide the goods they need.
The gasoline that fuels the boats in summer and the snowmobiles in winter is their most important commodity and is always in short supply. The Dudipta is rich in chir, a special fatty variety of whitefish, which is eaten raw and only slightly salted. Long-tailed skuas, which Middendorf called robber gulls, are always on hand when there is even the slightest possibility of coming up with a morsel of food. Smaller than a gull, the skua is a brazen thief who can steal food even from under the noses of five quarreling gulls. Children delight in teasing the pugnacious birds. Soon their summer vacation will be over and it will be time to return to school in Ustavam. Then they won't return home again until New Year's Eve. Dolgans were roaming the area of the river heads of the Pesino and the Hatanga and the hills near Norri Lake. They shared their hunting grounds with the Tungus people of Shigansk, whose way of life and language they have partially adapted. Their northernmost people, domiciled in three tents only, dwelt during my stay there in the Avam Tundra and on the banks of the Dupta River. In summertime, they tended to go even farther north as far as the riverhead of the Tymir. Their main food supplies consist of fish and wild reindeer. They said, apologetically, that they have no custom of northern skills needed to hunt for fur animals. This was probably a lie of convenience, meant to ward off greedy officials, priests and Cossacks, because they paid the taxes that were normally paid in fur with money that would otherwise have been hard to come by. In the barren tundra, the weather is prone to change without warning. When a storm hits, you're lucky if you can find a suitable spot to get ashore and away from the rising waves.
We found that all the boats in the waterway of Ustavam were stranded in the Dudipta estuary, waiting for the late summer high waters caused by slowly melting snow and permafrost, which would allow them to slip through for the last time this year. This happens right before the onslaught of the winter. Until then, there is nothing to do but wait. The local people are used to this and are resigned to this fact. As it turned out, the water level was high enough for our fleet of flying galoshes. We entered the Pasino River in full sail and waited for a boat going to Norilsk to tow us. We knew that our modified rubber boats were not strong enough to sail against the current. We had come through the Avam Tundra, but this was only a small part of Middendorf's route. Middendorf reached the settlement of Filipovskaya on the banks of the river Boganida on the first leg of his journey. From there he had to choose his route to the ocean. He gathered information about the way to Hatanga, an alternative route, but decided instead to go north via the Boganida River Valley. With him went the topographer Vagan of two Cossacks and an interpreter. Guides were hired from among the local Samoyeds. Our journey now had to be broken off, and its conclusion was postponed for a year. I needed to contemplate, as had Middendorf, how and with whom I would proceed. My final choice to flesh out the expedition was a filmmaker from Moscow, Vasily Sarana, who was making a movie about the muskoxen of the Taimir Peninsula. We met in Norilsk, the city that forms the hub of the Taimir region. Built during Stalin's reign, Using the forced labor of political prisoners, it is now a multinational and multicultural city. The hydrometallurgical plant of Norilsk produces a fifth of the world's nickel, in addition to cobalt, platinum, copper, and gold. Economic prosperity goes hand in hand with environmental catastrophe here. Vasya and I went to the local office of the Ministry of Extraordinary Situations to register our route to the Arctic Sea, which was originally taken by Middendorf. <laughs> И начнем наше путешествие. Весь маршрут километров 500 это все. Начинаем отсюда, вот где Лагата. И пошли каждый день километров по 50. То есть телефон у нас есть, так же само будем с вами связываться, информировать. И давайте так, если вы в воскресенье не выходите на связь, мы ждем понедельник. Да. И вот от, от того участка, где вы перед этим сказали, и до того участка, где вы, ну как бы, mm -hmm. мы будем идти mm -hmm. уже тогда у вас. This time, we hired a chopper to get us to the upper Taimir River. Like the previous year, the journey started in Valyok. Once again, the crew consisted of four men. Now there were two pairs of filmmakers. Vasily had brought on his assistant, Valery Fidirkin, who had been his classmate at the geographical faculty of Moscow University. We were heading north at speeds of up to 200 kilometers an hour. We covered the distance that took almost two months for Middendorf to cover in just three hours. Mm -hmm. 
Middendorf embarked from Boganida on the 19th of May and traveled in a Samoyed caravan of reindeer sleds to the Logata, a tributary of the Taimir. From there he went with the Dolgans to the upper Taimir River. Our journey took us farther and farther north, till snow covered the ground and thick ice the waters. The snow was equally deep everywhere, also being very soft and fluffy, so that without skis no nomad dared to exit his tent, nor the settler his hut. Now, in the heat of spring sun, an icy crust has formed in many places on the snow, which is deadly for all larger animals. This is because, like men, larger animals tend to sink through this crust, which wounds their legs badly and makes them bleed. On the 2nd of July, we reached the Taimir River at some distance from its estuary. The chopper landed in the yard of the Taimir Protected Biosphere Zone checkpoint, where the Logata and Upper Taimir rivers meet. It's more than 300 kilometers from here to the Arctic Ocean as the crow flies. The chopper crew wished us well and was gone. Now we were completely alone. Our only connection to civilization, should anything happen, was the same chopper that had just left us. Our provisions were meant to last for 30 days. We were counting on the river and the tundra to provide us with additional food. On the 13th of July, at about 6 in the evening, we finally embarked. The day was warm, with the temperature fluctuating between 13 and 18 degrees centigrade, depending on whether we were in the sun or not. We were traveling at 9 to 10 kilometers an hour. There was no way back, only forward to the Arctic Ocean. The 15th of July, we reached Middendorf's base camp. From here on, he also proceeded without the aid of locals. Our current campsite was called Settagamöller by the Samoyeds. This was the first place where we were completely alone. On a small hillock in the middle of the steep riverbank, we first erected our tent. We quickly set about to construct the boat, using boards from the bottoms of our sleighs for planking. After setting the planking in place, I had great trouble getting the whole contraption watertight. I was eagerly helped by one of our Cossacks who, having no idea whatsoever of the art of shipbuilding, nevertheless was one of those Russians who is most adept with his axe, to the point of using it as a substitute for a plane, saw or chisel. The axe being a universal, if somewhat crude, woodworking tool for him. Today, the world's biggest herd of wild reindeer roams the plains of the Taimir tundra. Reindeer are excellent swimmers and can easily cross rivers over a kilometer wide. A newborn calf must be able to keep up with the running and swimming of the others almost immediately. Often there are so many animals crossing that when the last ones are about to enter the river, the first are already emerging from the water on the opposite bank. This kind of mass crossing is called a reindeer bridge. I used the days after our arrival in Settagamöller for a small exploratory trip upriver. Even if the tundra seemed dull and monotonous, the wildlife here is most diverse. Much as forest animals need thick growth to thrive, there are also some animals that require empty woodless plains for their habitat where only they can cope. 
The most common animal in the time of thunder is, of course, the polar fox. I frequently found their burrows on the sides of small hillocks. They were easily recognized because of the lush vegetation around them, which was in no doubt caused by the well-ventilated ground, the warmth of their bodies, and the overpowering stench of ammonia and fecal fertilization. The riverbanks along the Tymir formed a contrast to the dull wasteland of the tundra. Here, water played its part as a climate regulator. Here was much needed protection from harsh early and light frosts. All of it was covered in lush vegetation blazing in all tones of color. What amazed me most was the diversity of flowers which presented themselves prominently against the background of the dark surface. Looking down, we usually saw more of the blossoms than of the leaves. Ученые, которые наблюдали за оленями, предполагают, что олени в день могут проходить от 100 до 150 километров. И все время они в движении, все время едят, в большей степени они идут по ветру, то есть против ветра, чтобы сдували, с них сдувались комары, и вот они идут по ветру, бегут даже, вот мы видели сколько раз они убегают от комаров, пытаясь спастись, вот и вот в день они преодолевают таким макаром до 100 километров, может и больше. Even this far north, where wild reindeer and man rarely cross paths, animals are wary of the funny-looking bipedal creatures, preferring to keep a safe distance. However, when their numbers are great enough, they may accept the presence of humans. The geese and ducks, which are shedding their feathers after nesting, are not so tolerant. At times when they are unable to fly away, they flee by running on the surface of the water. Before flowing into Lake Taimir, the river's estuary forms a delta. It might well be a couple of kilometers wide, but is so shallow that it won't even come up to your knees. For Middendorf, who didn't have a map at his disposal, choosing the right tributary was often a gamble. Yes. It was on Lake Taimir that Middendorf met the last natives he would encounter, and it seemed possible that we might too. There is a base camp on Cape Sabler where choppers heading further north are fueled. It was difficult to cross Lake Taimir in Middendorf's times, and it remains so now. The lake is enormous. Only Lake Baikal in Siberia is bigger. Numerous sandbars and changing winds make boat rides dangerous. The Samoyeds never went further than the western bayous and considered the lands further north mysterious and magical.
In answer to my enquiries as to why they have not pushed farther north to the sea, they replied in complete earnestness that this has been tried several times, but that there are enormous herds of polar bears who keep embushing the Samoyeds and drive them back. They describe the polar bears like a nation, skillful in defending the land. If eight men were to be sent from Samoyeds, the polar bears would counter with twelve opposing them. The riverbanks were somewhat shielded from winds by the Buranga Mountains. The midnight sun over the mountaintops invited us to step ashore. The lake seemed to consist mainly of numerous small bays, so that a uniform water surface was never formed. The bays of the southern shore, which I saw, and that the Samoyeds had told me about, were so shallow that numerous sandbanks were visible during low tide. Vegetation was sparse on the undulating dry high ground. Mosses and sedges formed half of it. There was no green carpet of vegetation like we are used to. The few plants to be seen grew in the form of sparse, withered bushes. We waited for the winds to ease, cut straight across the northern part of the lake, and entered the lower Taimir River. In the last week of July, the temperature had dropped a couple of degrees, and instead of pressing forward, more and more often, we had to seek shelter from the stormy weather. If you have never experienced it, you can have no idea of the ferocity of the winds here, which are akin to hurricanes rushing over the woodless northern plains. These storms are a series of whirlwinds which press on behind and beside each other, all nevertheless keeping a common general direction. Longer pauses often occur only to resume the hellish ride with a new vigor. Then again, you can be dazzled by sudden stillness which often marks the end of the storm. All this confirms my hypothesis that this is in fact a series of whirlwinds.
On the opposite bank, we sighted a lone musk ox, an animal that Middendorf could not have met during his travels in the middle of the 19th century. The musk ox once populated all of Eurasia, but became extinct in Siberia, like its ancient contemporary, the mammoth, thousands of years ago. The musk ox is not ideally suited for this climate today. It cannot survive when the snow is more than 30 centimeters deep. Neither is it comfortable in rapidly dropping temperatures, which can cause ice to form on its fur. Mountain passes provide some shelter from the cold, and the slopes are usually only thinly covered with snow. We saw the carcass of a bull, which had obviously drowned during the high waters. The musk ox is no match for the reindeer in getting nourishment from beneath the snow, nor can it swim as well. Changes in climate were among the factors that led to the extinction of the musk ox here, but improving hunting techniques of humans also played their part. Now, humans have reintroduced this magnificent beast to the Taimir. The project started in the 1970s with 50 animals from North America. By now, 30 years later, their numbers have grown into the thousands. At latitude 75 degrees north, there is a single polar day that lasts for three months. Still, this doesn't mean that it's all summer. The first snow fell on the 27th of July, on exactly the same day as Middendorf recorded it 160 years earlier. The temperature which until then had been between three to six degrees centigrade, dropped a few degrees. The humidity and constant contact with cold water had a devastating effect on our hands. It seemed that winter had begun in July and that for the last couple of weeks of our journey, we would have to cope with snow and ice. Where we could, we collected wood and stocked it for future use, but it was barely enough for cooking, never enough for drying our clothes or warming our aching joints. One thing set us apart from Middendorf on his journey. At this latitude, he had not been able to catch any fish and therefore had serious problems with provisions. Luckily, we had no such problem. We could easily get a full day's supply of fish merely by casting our net and drawing it straight back in. We only fished with a rod for fun as a pleasant pastime.
In addition to the cries of gulls, the wail of the rough-legged hawk is often heard in the tundra. As danger approaches, the hawk parents circle their nest, wailing anxiously. That's the only thing that the hawk, whose main diet is small rodents, does to protect its nest. Ironically, the circling and wailing often reveals the location of the nest to roaming predators. In Soviet times, the nature of the far north was studied extensively. Geological markers erected by expeditions stand in the tundra as a reminder of those times. Отметка выставлена, возможно, экспедиции московского филиала географического общества АН СССР. Отметка разобрана, собрана вновь 5 августа неизвестного года. Once the tundra was full of scientific expeditions and prospectors, groups of hunters and fishermen. Many abandoned campsites bear witness to their passage. They certainly don't blend into the natural environment. Vasya, a doctor of natural sciences in geography, has been exploring the tundra for decades and is going to propose that the geological faculty of Moscow University teach its students the full completion of field work. Here it looks like a chopper had arrived unexpectedly during lunchtime and took an expedition away in a hurry. The surface of the tundra is delicate and its recuperation takes time. If a tracked vehicle passes somewhere, its tracks scar the tundra for decades. Luckily, the tundra is such a vast place that there is still enough room between various tracks for some ground to remain untouched. We are drifting along, being carried by the current towards the sea. We always hope to see it from the next hill, but all we can see are new cliffs appearing on the horizon. In one place, the rocky banks had pushed the river together to such an extent that we even had to navigate some small rapids with our little boat. The river here is only half the width it had been before Lake Timer. My nerves wrecked by anxiety, I awaited signs of my predecessors who were here hundred years ago. At last, on August the 6th, we found a cave right on the bank of the river. There we spent the night of August the 7th. It corresponded well with the description that I had copied from the journal of the voyage of Captain Leptev, and it gave me back some lost courage. Despite the bad shape of our equipment, and despite the first snowstorm that hit us at the cave and reminded us of the arrival of autumn, 
I had no intentions of turning back. Middendorf reached the Arctic Ocean on the 13th of August and camped on an island in the estuary, which he named in honor of his mentor, Karl Ernst von Baer. He had reached his goal. Now he had to hurry to escape the onslaught of winter. Besides the freezing temperatures, the expedition was plagued by difficulties posed by a dropping water level. Our strength was waning. This was caused by insufficient nutrition on the one hand and by the extreme hardships endured on the other. Countless times we ran aground on sandbanks under full sail. Again and again, we had to take the oars and row. There was no other way to move on. Often we had to wade over the muddy sandbanks pulling the boat. Their boat was finally crushed by ice on Lake Taimir. Middendorf sent his companions to look for the Samoyeds and fetch help. I was left alone in the wasteland, almost 75 degrees north latitude, a few hundred versts from the nearest human habitats, far away even from the flimsy huts of the Samoyeds, with virtually no firewood. I had food for a meager two days. From our tarp, which we used as a windshield, I fashioned a sort of cave in the snow. In weary monotony, one day followed another. Soon, 12 days had passed, from the moment when my companions had left. I lost hope in help arriving. I was convinced that I'd been left to fend for myself, which meant that I might just as well be dead and buried. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to lie huddled in the snow covered with a piece of tarp for 19 days. He must have lost consciousness for part of that time. Compared to that, our worries about being airlifted a week earlier or later seemed trivial. It was the range of the chopper that made it necessary for us to turn back 50 kilometers before reaching the ocean. As if struck by lightning, I suddenly had an idea. I used up the remnants of my firewood and melted three cupfuls of water from the snow. After that, the invigorating fire went out. Then I poured the spirits from one of the preserved zoological specimens into the cup of water and drank it. This beverage gave me a new lease on life. Soon, I was fast asleep. How long I slept, I do not know. When I woke, I felt refreshed and recuperated. I took a needle and made myself a pair of snow boots. For the next day, I finished building a small sled and decided to go looking for our catch of provisions and my companions. On the 19th of September, I was carried by the Samoyeds into our tent, which was a long-awaited and welcome sight indeed, and there I was happily reunited with all my companions, even though I was suffering from diverse bodily ailments.
And here it was, our MI-8 helicopter. A little later than hoped for, but soon enough for us to save us from the hardships that Middendorf had to suffer. From the time here, Middendorf went on to Yakutia and the Amur River region. He returned home three years after his departure at just 30 years of age. Nevertheless, in those three years, he had gained an international reputation as an explorer and scientist. In his later years, although Middendorf was a sought-after lecturer for renowned European universities and an influential member of the Imperial Academy of Sciences, he always remained ready, even in the middle of his academic pursuits, to go off and continue to explore one of the world's unknown regions. Thank you.